This is Sky News at 12, our top stories. Calls for Hollywood to go further after Oscars bosses expel Harvey Weinstein from the Academy. British actress Lizette Anthony speaks out, saying she was raped by him in the 1980s. Anger over new equality laws, which mean doctors in England, could soon be asking who you're sleeping with. Hurricane Ophelia heads towards the UK as forecasters warn Ireland could be hit by winds of up to 80 miles an hour. Islamic State fighters evacuate Raqqa as US-backed militants uh, launch the final assault on the group's former capital. New plans for life sentences for drivers who cause fatal accidents. And the end of the round pound. Shoppers face the last day they can legally spend their old coins. Very good afternoon to you. The disgraced media mogul Harvey Weinstein has been definitively rejected by Hollywood after being expelled from the organisation behind the Oscars. Within hours of the announcement, two more women broke their silence to accuse him of rape. British actress Lizette Anthony claims he attacked her at her London home in the late 1980s, whilst another unidentified woman says she was raped in 1992. From New York, Hannah Thomas-Peter has this report. <laughs> Harvey Weinstein's films once dominated the Oscars he and American police are investigating the allegations against him. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News in New York. Now there have been calls today for Hollywood to take further action to root out the problem of sexual abuse and bullying. America's National Organization for Women said this this morning. They said Hollywood still has a pervasive problem with the systematic abuse of women by powerful men who believe their power and privilege will always protect them. But the hard work of changing the culture and holding abusers accountable for their crimes is just beginning. And we'll have a special programme on the allegations surrounding Harvey Weinstein later on today. That's Hollywood Secret Scandal at 1.30 and 3.30 p.m. Now, patients visiting their GP in England could soon be quizzed on their sexual orientation under new government plans. The NHS says it's to stay in line with equality laws and ensure no one is discriminated against. Well, guys, Olivia Kingsley joins us now. And Olivia, these are pretty personal details. Yes, they are. These are new proposals which would come in in 2019. Uh, new guidelines from NHS England which would see all health professionals, so that would include GPs, nurses and also people working in adult social care. And they are being told that they should be asking all patients aged 16 or over about their sexual orientation at every face-to-face -face meeting where that data is not already been recorded. Now, as you can imagine, it's quite divisive. There's lots of people quite angry about this this morning on social media saying that it's a real invasion of people's privacy, it's unnecessary, and that it's just not something that uh, doctors need to know unless there's a medical uh, relevance to it. I've had a chat to Dr. Peter Swinyard, the head of the Family Doctors Association this morning. He raised a number of concerns about this blanket approach, saying it will make a lot of patients feel very uncomfortable, it's unnecessary. He said it's not the job of GPs to be collecting data the government wants to know about sexuality. If it wants that information, perhaps it should put it in the next census. Now, on the other hand, there are some campaign groups who've campaigned uh, for this for years. Uh, they say it should prevent discrimination uh, by helping the NHS to comply with equality laws, by making sure they understand uh, the health needs of the gay and bisexual uh, community. NHS England are also pointing out this morning that people won't have to answer the question, that it will be very much up to them whether they want to share that information or not. OK, thank you. An emergency meeting is being held in Ireland in readiness for the arrival of Hurricane Ophelia due to hit the south of the country tomorrow. It's one of the most powerful storms to bear down on the UK in recent history and comes exactly 30 years to the day since the great storm of 1987 tore through. Sky's weather presenter Joe Wheeler has all the details. Well, this is a very interesting weather situation. We've all Wales and the southwest. US-backed fighters say they're engaged in a final battle to oust Islamic State militants from Raqqa, the extremist group's de facto capital in Syria. The city's tribal leaders say they're working to broker a deal for the remaining IS fighters to leave, and some reports suggest it's now just days from being liberated. Well, let's just remind ourselves of the history. The Islamic State group uh, came to the world's attention three years ago uh, when it began seizing ground in Iraq and 
Syria. Now, shown here in black are the areas taken by December 2014. Now, by mid-2015, it had seized Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, and had declared the Syrian town of Raqqa its de facto capital. By 2017, the terror organization had lost huge swathes of territory, including Mosul, which was recaptured by Iraqi security forces in July. Now, a month before that, US-backed Syrian forces also launched an offensive to retake Raqqa. Now, by mid-August, the Syrian Democratic Forces had seized 50% of the city, aided by airstrikes by US and coalition forces. A month later, forces led by Kurdish militia, the YPG, had declared the Grand Mosque and Old City from IS control. And in October, the RAF carried out multiple strikes on the northwest of the city. But fighting continued around the National Hospital, while the city's stadium remained among the last areas held by IS. Now, as the Islamic State capital crumbles, a deal has been struck to bus out civilians so as to avoid casualties. Uh, well, Sky's Lisa Holland joins us uh, with more on this. And it's taken some time to get to this stage, hasn't it, Lisa? Yes, I mean, uh, Raqqa, of course, is the de facto capital for the Caliphate of Islamic State, which um, is symbolically huge if Raqqa falls. But um, whilst we are in the end game, it's not entirely over yet in Raqqa because you've got this hardcore of foreign fighters. Um, we know that, of course, there's been intense fighting and the estimates are that the SDF, which is a coalition of Arab and Kurdish fighters, are in control now of some 90% of Raqqa. But it will be this hard street to street fighting to clear out the final um, Islamic State foreign fighters which is going to be really difficult now reports suggest that these hardcore foreign fighters um, have dwindling weapons that they have poor communication lines with other members of the Islamic State um, but still they will be digging in because where else do they go there has been a deal cut to allow some civilians to leave um, and also some local IS fighters as well there are conflicting reports about whether that deal will include the foreign IS fighters. Um, a senior figure within the Raqqa Civil Council has been quoted by um, Agence France Press as saying that it will include foreign fighters. Now that conflicts with other reports to suggest no, um, they will stay and that they will now be involved in this hardcore fighting with the SDF, US-backed SDF. Um, but still, from a civilian perspective, there are suggestions that um, some 400 or so people are being held at the National Hospital. Um, very many more, the UN say as many as a thousand or so as human shields in the city. So it's a desperate situation on the ground? Yeah, absolutely, um, which is why um, these talks have been taking place to try to get civilians out because clearly supplies are very short. Um, this is a dreadful humanitarian situation. We've seen the relief amongst many civilians who have been allowed to leave, um, but we simply don't know exactly how many remain. Some people say say um, it's up to 500 foreign fighters and as many as a thousand or so civilians we simply don't know and we of course saw the fight for Mosul uh, we kept hearing that they were getting closer and closer to taking it but it's a very very long process and I presume this is going to be the same kind of situation the difficulty is that it, the fighting now is street to street so we've had the phase where there's been the heavy bombardment um, I think the SDF have been very successful in managing to take some 90%, given that this is Raqqa, this is the, the last bastion um, of Islamic State. This is the capital of their self-declared caliphate across Iraq and Syria. So, you know, as we said before, symbolically, this is a massive thing. But again, in some senses, it's like catching water. Those who have managed to escape will go on to try to reclaim areas that have already been lost, for example, Fallujah, back to the Sunni triangle that they want to regain control so it will be a kind of moving around problem and as we know to um, cost ourselves here in the UK you can still be influenced by Islamic State even if they have lost um, a declared capital like Raqqa. Absolutely thanks ever so much thank you. The number of people killed by bomb blasts in Mogadishu has risen to 85. The attack struck busy junctions in the centre of the Somali capital yesterday afternoon, local time. At least 100 others were injured in the explosion. The Somali's president has declared three days of national mourning. 
People in Austria are voting in the general election. If the leader of the Conservative People's Party, Sebastian Kurz, were to win, he'd become the European Union's youngest leader at just 31. His party may try to form a coalition with the far-right Freedom Party. Both parties want to see failed asylum seekers deported more quickly from the country. A 50-year-old man has died in what's being described as a stable yard incident at Kempton Park Racecourse last night. Surrey police are investigating that the death is currently being treated as unexplained. The meeting was abandoned following the incident. Well, breaking news now. Theresa May and her German counterpart Angela Merkel has spoken this morning to discuss the Iran nuclear deal and Brexit. Uh, well, our political correspondent Lewis Goodall is in Westminster for us now. And Lewis, just bring us up to date with what's been said. Well, uh, a rare event really for Theresa May to be able to largely talk to a European politician, not about Brexit, but about uh, other international affairs. Obviously, all of the major European powers are united in being extremely concerned about President Trump's decision to or suggestion that the US would pull out of the Iran uh, nuclear deal. They've spoken about the fact that uh, they agreed that Germany, bo should, uh, both the UK and Germany, both remain fir fir firmly committed uh, to the deal. They also say agreed that the international community need to continue to come together to push against back against Iran's destabilizing regional activity and they've agreed to discuss that further at the European Council in Brussels next week. But more evidence I think that uh, Theresa May's Downing Street continues to distance itself against uh, against the, uh, the uh, Donald Trump and the uh, White House. Of course much speculation uh, when he first came to office. Donald Trump apparently briefing the papers that uh, their relationship would be like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. I think it's very Fair, it's fair to say that uh, during Margaret Thatcher's days there would have been no such conversation like this. It was very difficult most of the time to put a cigarette paper between the White House and Downing Street at that time. Further evidence, I think, if anyone needed, that Theresa May is moving further away. Not least as we learned also this week that Donald Trump would not get his state visit next year as he, I think he thought that he had been promised. Downing Street saying that would be put off um, into the future, just a working visit for the president next year. Uh, and Theresa May been speaking uh, with no doubt obviously about Brexit today and it's also been reported that a cross-party group of MPs is drawing up plans that would allow Parliament to stop her agreeing a no Brexit deal. Uh, what more do we know about that? Well, it's, it's very interesting. I think this is really the most significant Brexit news that we've uh, had this week, really. I think this is the week that the idea of no deal really has loomed largest. I think most politicians had large, uh, on both sides of the Remain and Lever divide, had thought that in the end, in the 59th minute of the 11th hour on the last day, that uh, some deal might be put together. But I think politicians have really started to embrace the idea and start to think about, not least put money to as well, the idea of of uh, there being no deal. And you've seen a collection of MPs from across the House of Commons saying, if there is no deal, what we really want is a vote in the House of Commons on it, because in effect that would be a very different situation than that which we uh, were promised. And it's something that John McDonnell, the Labour shadow chancellor, was addressing a little bit earlier on this morning. I'm not willing to countenance no deal. I will work with anybody in Parliament to secure a decent deal for our country. I will put aside any party interest in the interest of our country. Now, what this would effectively mean is that Parliament would be able to, would be able, if the government came back and said, I'm sorry, but the uh, uh, Brussels negotiations have gone wrong, there isn't going to be a deal, we're going to crash out of the European Union without a deal, Parliament would be able to say, well, no, we will vote against there being no deal. But the question is then, is that effectively becomes a, is that tantamount to a vote to stay in the European Union? Because if you're voting against no deal, against no deal, what does that mean? You're voting effectively to stay in. But the problem is, is that you can't stop the Article 50 uh, stopwatch, if you like, uh, from ticking down unless you get agreement from Brussels. So I think the peculiar situation of all of this is at the moment you've got lots of Lever MPs who are actually rather hoping that there would be no deal because they think that no deal would give them the hardest, cleanest Brexit, um, as they would say. I think if I were a Leave MP, I would be hoping that the government does manage to put together a deal because the last thing you want is a vote in the House of Commons, which would effectively mean that the pro-Remain majority in the House of Commons, and never forget most MPs do not want to leave the European Union, would be able to potentially put a stop on the Brexit process by voting against a no deal. So an interesting development today. Lewis, thank you. Well, meanwhile, UKIP has a new leader. Now, if you think you've heard that before, it's because you have. Henry Bolton is the fourth leader in the space of a year. So who exactly is he? Well, a short time ago, he spoke to Sky's Neil Patterson about badgers, burkas 
and the bone blast that blew him off his feet. I <laughs> discovered this morning, thanks mm -hmm. to uh, the Sunday Times, that in an interview with Russia Today, you said that you could strangle a badger with your bare hands. Is that correct? Uh, they, they gave me a, a few options as a, a ideas for an initiation ceremony. You're watching Sky News coming up. Why you can be shortchanged this weekend as the round pound is consigned to history. Buy online today. Delivered to you today. Go Argos. Welcome back. You're watching Sky News. Let's find out coming up in the sport. Yes, coming up in the sport at a quarter two. It was a familiar sight at the show. Thank you. Now, if you're in the mood to spend, you've got just 12 hours left to put your old round pound coins into good use. British households have already got rid of £60 million worth of them, but there are thought to be still £400 million in circulation. Sky's Phil Edwards has this report. More than one and a half billion of them have been minted over the past 34 years, but at midnight tonight, they'll cease to be legal tender. But if you knowingly use one in a vending machine, you will potentially be breaking the law by committing fraud. Phil Edwards, Sky News. Time now to take a check on the weather. By the springtime flowers of a mountain lake, to the first snowfall, on a winter's day. What's left of Hurricane Ophelia is heading into the southwest for tomorrow, bringing potentially disruptive winds. Before then, England and Wales will be mostly fine today, but there will be patchy rain elsewhere. Uh, I'm pleased to say it'll be warm just about everywhere. England and Wales will be mostly dry and bright all afternoon, but far north of England may see a little rain later on. Scotland, Ireland and Northern Ireland, meanwhile, will see some patchy light rain, but that will become largely confined to southern Scotland and the south and east of Ireland by the evening, with some brighter spells developing elsewhere. Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland will turn again tonight, although the rain will largely clear from the south of Ireland later on, and it will be pretty windy in the southwest, with coastal gales likely. England and Wales, meanwhile, will be mainly dry, but there will be a few lighter showers and more general rain for the far north by the morning. It will be very, very mild. Monday will be mostly fine for England and Wales, wet elsewhere, with gales or severe gales in the west. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. This is Sky News coming up. Good afternoon to you. Earlier on today, apparently a woman rang the BBC and said she heard that there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. But having said that, actually... Well, 30 years after that infamous weather forecast, Michael Fish joins us to talk about Hurricane Athena. Sports.com slash Joshua or press a green button. You're watching Sky News, the top stories. British actress Lizette Anthony is the latest to accuse Harvey Weinstein of rape following movie mogul's expulsion from the Oscars ceremony. Patients visiting their GP in England could soon be asked to declare their sexual orientation under new government plans. And the British Isles are preparing for Hurricane Ophelia, expected to hit the south of Ireland early tomorrow morning. Let's stay with Hurricane Ophelia now. It's expected to be one of the most powerful storms to bear down on the UK in recent history. It comes 30 years to the day since the great storm of 1987. Well, back then, BBC weatherman Michael Fish made this now infamous statement in his lunchtime forecast. Good afternoon to you. Earlier on today, apparently a woman rang the BBC and said she heard that there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. But having said that, actually, the weather will become very windy. But most of the strong winds, incidentally, will be down over Spain and uh, across into France as well. But there's a vicious-looking area of low pressure. Well, I'm pleased to say that uh, the man himself joins me now. Lovely tie for the occasion. Thank you very much. <laughs> so 30 years ago, since the last great storm, mm. and what's the chances of there being yet another one? It's ironic, isn't it? That, although this is, this is a completely different, uh, as you might say, kettle of fish. You were saying just now it was a hurricane. It is a hurricane now, but it's shortly going to become an ex-hurricane and uh, won't have the same characteristics as the sort of storms that affect the Caribbean. But having said that, it is a pretty vicious monster when it arrives over Ireland tomorrow and could well have gusts of 90 miles an hour. And that will also affect the western parts of England and Wales 
and then on Tuesday over Scotland. So it's a nasty monster, but we, we can't be calling it, well, we shouldn't be calling it a hurricane, uh, not after the next few hours at least. And I remember the one back in the 80s, I mean, it must have been about five at the time, but I still remember it vividly. Uh, how have things changed in terms of the technology since back then? Because of course, you said yeah. there wasn't going to be yeah. a hurricane. You made me feel old. <laughs> five. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, yes, things have changed a lot. We did have computers, we did have computer models and things like that, but the trouble is they weren't all that powerful. The computers we had in the late 70s, early 80s were no more powerful than your smartphone. And you can imagine doing a forecast for the whole of the Northern Hemisphere on a smartphone. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be very easy, but that's all there was available. And there weren't many observations either, whereas now we have billions, literally billions, of observations going to the computer every day, they come from satellites, mostly ships, aircraft, boys, human beings even occasionally. Do you think we're a bit more cautious now as well about predicting things? Because the Met Office are very quick to come out with, you know, weather warnings, aren't well, they? Well, that's right. That's so they should be. That's the whole idea of the weather warning system. Uh, we're very good now. We can see these things four or five days in advance and warn of them. Uh, Southern Ireland, for instance, has a red warning at the moment in anticipation for uh, tomorrow morning's weather. And, I mean, back then, what went through your head when you knew you'd made that tremendous gaffe? Well, I, I, nothing went through my head as such. I know this is an excuse, but it, it wasn't anything to do with me. Neither myself nor Bill Giles, who came after me with an equally f uh, downgraded forecast saying it was going to be a little bit breezy up the channel. Neither of us were strictly speaking to blame because we were purely the voice of the computer. We had no input to the forecast whatsoever. We had nothing to do with the forecast. The computer spewed out the data. The senior forecaster at the Mellowes headquarters interpreted it. And we just uh, spoke in general public speak. But I suppose, really, it's made your career, hasn't it? It's made my career. It's made, well, here I am. Who'd have thought years that I'm on. here 30 years' time? I can't wait for the 50th anniversary. <laughs> Oh, blimey, that's a long time away, isn't <laughs> it? Um, this storm tomorrow, um, how significant is that going to be? The one tomorrow? Well, for, for Ireland and western parts of the country, and later on on Tuesday for Scotland, very significant. There could be some quite damaging gusts and some very heavy rain. So, yes, we can't ignore it, which is why the Irish have already issued a red warning for be prepared. Well, thank you ever so much for coming in. Uh, it's great to see you. And... Uh, yeah, hopefully see you before those 20 years. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> You're younger. Uh, now, Harvey Weinstein has been rejected by Hollywood's elite following the mounting claims of sexual assault and harassment against him. Claims that he denies, but many within the film industry say that throwing the producer out of the Oscars Academy isn't enough and the wider problem of abuse by men in positions of power must be addressed. Well, from North London, we're joined now by Sophie Walker, the leader of the Women's Equality Party. Uh, very good afternoon to you. Um, do um, you think more needs to be done then? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, you need only look, first of all, at the process of ejecting Weinstein from the Oscars board. Um, that was not a unanimous decision, um, which is not really surprising when you consider that um, the Oscars board is uh, three quarters male and mostly white. Um, uh, what we have to do in those kind of situations is looking at diversifying the board, diversifying the representatives on those boards. Then you start to diversify the kind of films that get made. You start to diversify the kind of people who are getting work and the conditions in which they work. And, and then you start to really change the industry. But certainly this, I think, is going to bleed into uh, many, many other areas. We're already seeing this morning, uh, for example, that Amazon is reopening its case um, against its head of entertainment studio, uh, Roy Price, a case that they had previously dismissed after an internal investigation. And, you know, I've had several conversations just over the last couple of days uh, with women across multiple professions who are coming together to compare notes, um, to speak out, you know, and we, I think we will, we will really start to see many more companies uh, reviewing decisions to bury previous claims, frankly. I mean, every day we're seeing more and more uh, women come and speak out. I should point out Harvey Weinstein has uh, denied uh, having non-consensual sex with anyone. But what do you make of the fact that so many women are speaking out uh, and, you know, the issue in general? 
Well, I think this speaks to a fundamental imbalance of power between men and women, frankly. Um, and I think that is going to take a very long time to resolve. I mean, that's one of the reasons that the Women's Equality Party set up, because the pace of change is glacial. And because as a society, we are so reluctant to look at these structural barriers in front of women that do result in this epidemic of violence and do hold women back from being able to be included in business, in politics, uh, in civil society, in our institutions. Um, you know, obviously, we have got a whole range of measures that we want to look at in terms of how we bring those barriers down and, and, and include women. But I think there are also um, more details that we need to look at. For example, um, uh, the prosecution uh, or the, the uh, discussion in, in sexual harassment cases, the, the question of whether, whether legal settlements now are actually helpful, it, it, I think is... Uh, when I say legal settlements, I mean the gagging of, of, of women as part of those legal settlements, I think is is deeply problematic because, you know, the, the, the power play in those kind of settlements is between abuser um, uh, and, and survivor. And that, you know, for that then to give space to silence women um, is really problematic. I think also, you know, we have got to look at the fact that uh, the resolution of this problem at the moment relies primarily on, on women coming through um, to, to speak up uh, in an environment where they are regularly disbelieved, uh, humiliated. Um, you know, we had um, uh, Oliver Stone, the, the man who believes in pretty much every conspiracy theory going, uh, came out and said he didn't, he couldn't possibly really believe what, had, you know, that, that, what, that what these allegations against Harvey Weinstein were, were real. So that shows you the scale of the problem that we have, and that shows you that we really... You know, this is systemic, and it needs a systemic solution. Uh, lots of women saying that the problem was that Harvey Weinstein had the power to either make or break exactly. their careers. Uh, does Hollywood need to do more? Yes, we are, but we all need to do more. I mean, Hollywood has a massive problem and it needs to diversify. And that's why, for example, you know, the, the, the situation on the Oscars board is, is really, really telling. Uh, uh, there is a, there is a, um, there is a, a system where men um, uh, are in power and they're looking after other powerful men's interests. And that has got to be broken down. We have got to get more women, more women of colour, um, more people from all different backgrounds into, into that society. And it's particularly important because you know, the media is the means by which we tell stories. And, and so long as the media regularly demeans and belittles women, um, prevents the victims from coming forward and then humiliates them when they do, we will continue to have a massive problem here. OK, thanks for your time. Welcome. We've got some breaking news to bring you now from Somalia, uh, where police have just updated the number of people killed by a bomb in Mogadishu yesterday. In the last few moments or so, police said they now believe at least 189 people have died and more than 200 were injured. It was the largest and deadliest truck bomb ever to be detonated in the Somalian capital. Uh, the Somalian president has declared three days of national mourning. Uh, so just to recap on that breaking news then, that 189 people are now believed to have died uh, with more than 200 people injured in that bomb blast. You're watching Sky News. Coming up in the sports, how Roger Federer eased past Rafael Nadal to win yet another title. The weather hits. Our engineers can help. Stay a step ahead of winter. Search British Gas. Drivers who cause death by dangerous driving could face life in prison under tough new legislation. It'll apply to motorists who cause fatal crashes by speeding, using a mobile phone whilst behind the wheel, or are caught under the influence of drink or drugs. Sky's Katerina Vitozzi has this report. It can take just a moment to destroy lives forever. Thomas Croker was on his phone when his lorry crashed into and killed a family of four for dangerous cycling. Katerina Vitozzi, Sky News. We're time now to take a check on the sport. This programme is brought to you by Vitality Health and Life Insurance. Getting active brings its own rewards. <sighs> Batteries must have run out. Roger Federer eased to victory against world number one Rafa Nadal to win the Shanghai Masters in straight sets. Right, plenty more sport live on Sky Sports News and we're back a little bit later. And that's the end of the show. I'm off for a biscuit. Anyone fancy? Hmm?
lovely day out there. Let's see if it's set to continue. From the clear blue sky of a Doha morning to the fresh autumn breeze in the city of love. What's left of Hurricane Ophelia is heading into the southwest for tomorrow, bringing potentially disruptive winds. Before then, England and Wales will be mostly fine today, but there will be patchy rain elsewhere. It will be worn just about everywhere. England and Wales will be mostly dry and bright all afternoon, but far north of England may see a little rain later on. Scotland, Ireland and Northern Ireland, meanwhile, will see some patchy light rain, but that will become largely confined to southern Scotland and the south and east of Ireland by the evening, with some brighter spells to developing elsewhere. Island, Northern Ireland and Scotland will turn wet again overnight. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. This is Sky News coming up. All the latest on the Harvey Weinstein scandal as Hollywood turns its back on the movie mobile. We'll have the very latest on all those developments coming up after this very short break.